Benifer, Brangelina, Kimye, Jelena, BZ, Haler, and Tomcat. Now you might not know what I'm talking about, but certainly some teenagers would. What am I doing? These are what are known as ship names. Okay, listen carefully. Ship names with a P on the end. Celebrity ship names. It's short for the word relationship, and it's to take the combination of two individual names, blend them together, and make a ship name. It's shorthand for, you know, the relationship and just referring to the two of them together. So Benifer is Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez, um, if you missed that one. Um, Brangelina is Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. So now you think about that, those two, the Bible said, should become one, so maybe God doesn't mind if we ship name and all that. You actually can have an app if you want to download it after today. Um, it, it's free, uh, and you probably get what you pay for, but it will actually find a ship name for you and any other person, you know, and sometimes they're very clever. They're very uh, intricate the way they do it because they'll take part of their last name and part of your last name and different things and put them together and you go, oh man. And, and there's at least a, a, a thought in some people's mind. It's kind of the modern equivalent. Um, maybe way back I've heard that you'd see it in movies or something. People would dream of what their first name would sound like with another person's last name and they'd go, are we a good match? Well, does the name alliterate? Does it sound good? It's a match made in heaven. It sounds so good, you know, and that sort of thing. Well, you know, if you get a good ship name, well, maybe it'll work, you know. And so I'm glad our actual relationship, Lynn and I's, works better than our ship name because if you think about Lynn and Scott, um, it's lot or sin, Would, if, you, if you do them. And I'm like, a lot of sin or sin a lot? I don't, I don't know. That, okay, that, that didn't work. Uh, you know, go back to the drawing board and try some different things with, uh, you know, uh, her, her maiden last name was, was Sheeter, and, and you can, you know, only imagine some of the things. So, uh, but don't. And, and so this list of blended names, you know, again, that I read, what, what you know, if you know anything about celebrities, sadly, those ships, most of them shipwrecked. I mean, even though their name kind of blended really well, apparently not everything went as well. And you think about that again, you would think, you would think of all people who would find it the easiest to be content, right? It would be these beautiful, blessed, talented, amazing, incredible people, right? I mean, they are in so many cases blessed with finances and, and physicality and just all of these things that you go, well, that, that would be easy because you got a person who's content and then they get with another person who's content and what do you know there's just contentment despair and it's just amazing right but we know a little bit better right and so that's why i wrote this word the way i wrote it which is real asian ships okay i like to again play with words but real relationships real relationships when you think about the reality of relationships well it's very easy for a ship to become a shipwreck Right? It's very easy for things to go, you know, start sailing off and thinking you're going to have smooth sailing in some relationship and, and have it not match that reality. And what I love about the Bible is it always keeps it real. You know, whatever age you find yourself at, whatever stage you find yourself at, um, you know, in your filling out forms, you're always having to circle your status. You know, are you in a relationship, out of a relationship, it's complicated. I'm single, I'm married, I'm widowed, I'm divorced, I'm, uh, you know, whatever the, the different combinations might be. Well, the Bible gives us real insights into some of these things, and not everything is going to be obvious right up front. But one of the other little uh, acronyms that's out there, I really like this one, it's called OTP. Anybody know what OTP is? Of course people do. It's the one true pairing. What is it? It's, it's where you look at somebody and go, no, 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 these of all possibilities, there's that one out there for me. That's the one. And that's the one true pairing. And sometimes you'll look at somebody and say, oh, that's an OTP couple for sure. And other times you say, I don't know how this one's lasted the three minutes it has, you know, and things like that. And so you look at soulmates and all those things that people talk about, the own only one. But the last part of that relationship word there, ship, 
if you look closely at what I did with the graphic, you know, I have fun doing these. That's part of the reason I do them. They, it, uh, I have fun for me doing it. So even if you don't like it, I do. So uh, I'm letting you know I found this cargo ship, right? It's a picture of a cargo ship, and it was overloaded. It was misloaded in such a way that it got out to sea, and all those containers started leaning over and falling over. And in fact, this uh, ship here turned into a shipwreck and, and fortunately no loss of life, but a lot of loss of other things. And you know, all those containers, if you're wondering where your shipment went, maybe that's where it went, right? You're waiting on that thing that didn't get delivered. It was probably in one of those containers and it's now at the bottom of the sea. And so what you see is it was out of balance, right? It, it wasn't loaded correctly. It was overloaded. And so you think about the content of that, right? The content, what was, what was that? Contentment contains the word content, right? The content. And when I think about you or me, and I think of my life as a ship, you know, I have to be, and this is kind of the big thought today. If you, if you think of nothing else today, I hope you'll walk away with this, whatever your age and stage of life, you know. You need to learn, I need to learn, we need to learn to be content with our content. What does that mean? I'm just content with me. See, because until I'm content with me, there's no way I'm going to be content in my family. Um, that's my goal. My, my goal is personal contentment because if I can be content with my content, well, then guess what? I don't have to go around looking for somebody else or somebody's else or something else to fill the void within me, fill the emptiness within in me because I'm so discontent that I think somebody else's job is to make my life better, right? That's, that's somebody's job, somebody out there. If I can just find that one true pairing, then that person is going to fill the emptiness within me or the sense of discontent or dissatisfaction. See, and when I think about that, again, that's a pretty interesting thought, just to say, am I content with my content? Am I looking to be fulfilled through somebody else? Or has God given me all that I need, in a sense, to be content in myself? See, the quality of our life will be largely you know, determined, I believe, um, by the quality of our relationships, not necessarily the quantity. In fact, sometimes there's a trade-off between those, that you can have a quantity of relationships that you go, man, it was a different person every night. And you go, wow, that's quite a quantity. I know of rock stars who have boasted of tremendous quantity of relationships. And yet you look at your, their life today and you think, well, would I want to be them? Are they content with their content? Apparently, in some ways, not. And so, so many of them ending even their life because of discontent. And yet you say, man, so much content in their life. How did that happen? So this is kind of a practical teaching on how not to sink your ships, okay? How not to sink your relationships. How, and, and what's great is this chapter runs the gamut. I'm going to kind of like hit each one of these fast but because I'm hoping you'll go and look at your own life and where you fit into this um, and, and kind of highlight on that and think on it some more because I certainly can't cover everything today. But um, I want to talk fast through it because he goes everything from romantic relationships and marriage to work relationships in one chapter. I mean, there's just like this huge, uh, you know, spectrum of things going on here. And so it's how not to sink all of your ships. Because again, ships, even in the, in the ship world where kids talk about that, it's not always romantic relationships. Sometimes they're talking about the delicate dis thing between these two friends who are always like back and forth and which one's gonna like, really win out in terms of their personality is going to be the dominant one in the relationship and all that stuff. So, I mean, it's, it, you know, it's a big word, ship. And so, again, this talks about marriage, separation, divorce, singlehood, widowhood, workhood, everything. I mean, it's everything. So, again, very, can be a very sensitive subject. But the, let's look there at verse 1, and hopefully we're sensitive enough and mature enough to hit it. It says, concerning the things, now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, if that were the only verse in the Bible, I probably 
wouldn't be a Christian. I'd say, well, man, that's messed up. Okay, this, this is like puritanical. This is crazy. Um, it, what kind of what kind of standard is this? You know, no guy should ever touch any lady ever. You know, and, and this would be good in the hall of the school or whatever. But 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 you get what I'm saying. Notice this. This is super important. Now concerning the things you wrote to me. Remember, there's a lost letter. There's a non-preserved uh, letter from the Corinthians to Paul saying, hey, we got a bunch of questions. So this is a question and answer format. And he's saying, oh, you asked me a question. It's kind of like, you know, dear Abby, but it's dear Apostle, dear Apostle Paul, got a question. We got some questions and so he's answering questions. So it's half of a phone call. You got to remember, you got to fill in some blanks. So you got to put on your thinking cap when we go through this. So if that's all it said and someone were to lift that out, they might have a very different view of what God thinks about all that. Um, growing up, we had cootie spray. I don't think kids do that as much anymore. It's, it was a very analog thing, but it was, it was cootie spray. Like if a girl sat somewhere, you would spray it, right? Because, ew, gross. And somewhere along the line, I don't know where it was, but we stopped spraying for cootie spray and we all of a sudden started spraying things that made us smell better. So we're like, hey, all of a sudden we w thought they were gross and then all of a sudden we didn't want to be gross, right? When does that happen? How does that happen? Well, you know how that happens. But were the Corinthians concerned about cooties? Was he saying, hey, don't, don't touch, you know, that's like gross. No, he was, he was answering a philosophical question that was rampant in their day which is, is physicality good or is it bad? Does God promote it or is he against it? Is God a killjoy? He doesn't like anything that feels good. If it feels bad, it's God. If it feels good, it isn't, right? I mean, there's people who live that way and think that way. They, they were called the ascetics, if you don't know, in, in Greek philosophy. It was basically abstain from all forms of pleasure. If it feels good, don't do it. That was their Greek philosophy. And then there were others, um, the Epicureans were their names. They were the ones who, would, if it feels good, do it. I mean, they were like, do everything. And then there was a group of people saying, no, do nothing. So there was these extreme views, right? They remain to this day. So their question, you might say, is who's right, who's wrong? Are ships bad? Is it bad to have a ship? Is it bad to want a relationship? Is it bad to have desires and physical realities to our life is God against all that that's that would have been the kind of way we would ask that question and so I wrote down this thought if you're single in the room or you ever you know might be or whatever I wrote down this a single should not be pressured to mingle <laughs> what is he saying here don't 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 buy into this thought that I will be content if I can just find the right person to make me content because I'm so discontent now. And, and this is it. There are people who have a hyper sense of emptiness unless they have a relationship. They don't even really think too much about the quality of it as the quantity of it. I have watched this with my own eyes in the hallways right down the street here. But it could be true anywhere. It doesn't matter what age. I'm not just trying to point at teenagers or young people. The truth is there are people who just aren't complete without another person there and, and generic other person there. I just need somebody to be that body. And you go, well, wait a minute. A single shouldn't be pressured to mingle, not from inside, not from outside. You know, outside in Jewish society, there was a strong thing. And I won't, you know, try to be too stereotypical, but come on, this was the idea of the Oh, you know, you're getting on in years. You're like 12 now. You know, it's time to start thinking about these things. And you're like, what? I mean, they were married much earlier than we were. They were arranged marriages. So remember, context. Think about what he's writing to. He's writing into people who their cultural heritage was maybe very one way. And then here they are in Corinth. They're displaced into Corinth. And Corinth is anything goes and then they run into people who say no no god's not into that stuff and and it's just very confusing for him so he says you know what it's good for a guy not not to touch a lady now the literal translation there is to attach oneself to this is not like hey how how are you nice to it was it's good for a guy not to cling to a a, a lady and just like randomly you you'll make me content you'll make me happy ah. Desperation is not a very attractive property. 
And so a single shouldn't be pressured to mingle. It's okay to be single. It's great to be single. Single is good. Could I tell you how many married people <laughs> envy single people? Isn't it funny that single people envy married people sometimes? And they go, oh, that's where all the good stuff is. Well, think about this. His, his statement, Paul's statement, in answer to the question is within the wider context of the Bible saying marriage is God-given, is good. It's not good for a man to be alone. I agree with that, Genesis 2, 18. God has not designed most people for a lifelong singleness. In fact, statistically speaking, most people marry at least once and many more times in many cases, but most people will be single at some point in their life. And to them, I would ask for them to just let it resonate deep. It's okay. In fact, it's enviable in some ways. It's great. It's good. There's no pressure here. There's no, should be no internal pressure. I got, I got, whoa, ah. Relax. A single shouldn't feel like they have to mingle. And, you know, it's okay. That's what Paul is saying. It's a lifetime calling for a few, but it's only a season for most. And that season will come and that season will go. And, you know, as much as when we're cold, we, we think, man, can't wait for the summer to be here. I'm so cold. And then the summer's here and you're like, oh, I'm baking. I need to be, ah, when's it going to cool off? And you go, man, it's so easy to be discontent in a season, right? So if you're in a single season, be content. If you're in a married season, be content. This is what he's saying. A single person should be at peace and shouldn't let people put pressure on them. I've met an awful lot of married people, again, uh, who think back to their single days and they say, oh, you don't know how good you have it. And then singles look on, they're so sad, and they're like, oh, man, you guys don't know how much I want that. And you go, what? Just want where you are. And now, again, I'm preaching to myself. I am preaching to myself. Because if it, there's ever a guy who's always thought that contentment was just over the next corner, or past the next bend, or, you know, with the next achievement or whatever. See, you can put anything. It's not just people in there. Contentment. God meant us to be content. Contentment. We were meant to be content with our content. That God says, it's enough. See, I think about singleness, singleness, amusement park. Go to an amusement park. You know what you get? Single rider. If you like riding amusement park rides, which is why I go, I, um, I, I'm that guy who doesn't want to go and like go with a group where everyone rides like one ride a day and mainly just talks about what ride they do or don't want to go on. I'm like a ride hound. I like go on the ride. So I'm like single, you know, and, and Lynn and I have actually gone through the single line together um, and ended up, you know, kind of gaming the system or like single um, go through. the. I, I, I don't need to sit right next to her all the time. I mean, we, we go to the park. We're cool. Like she doesn't need to be on my lap on every ride. You know, it's like uh, you can go to the front that way. Think about travel and all the things, work, go school. It's okay to be single. Single is fine. It's good. Don't let anyone pressure you beyond that, you know. So for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, this is one of the things that God, I believe, put into each of our lives that we will probably have a situation where there will be that person that will come along. And you know what? We'll, we'll get married. That happens in most people's lives. And you know what they'll find out? It is wonderful and very, very, very difficult. So this is what he says. Verse 2, he says, Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife. Let each woman have her own husband. No, say, it didn't say let each man have his own girlfriend and side chick. It says wife. It says one-to-one. -one. This is a one-to-one -one type of thing. And sometimes people draw a distinction between what our society calls serial monogamy, which is they basically say, hey, I'm only with one at a time. You know, I, I, I don't cheat on people. I'm like, you know, I was with this lady for two years and it was, we were in love. And then three years, you know, we were in love with a, over here. And you go, okay, okay, okay. I, here's the truth. Even when you're talking in a non-Christian context, this is not what people want. This is not what people dream of. And I'm not just talking about ladies. I'm talking about guys. Guys, deep down, it's funny, all the love songs written, they're not written about, you know, they're either written about a lifelong love or a loss of a love that they thought was going to be that. Isn't it incredible how this is what people want? People want 
romance. People want intimacy. They want all of these things. But to quote Beyonce, um, or BZ, I don't know if he helped her write it, if you, if you like it, put a ring on it. That's what, you know, all the single ladies, if you like it, put a ring on it. Commit. And see, here's the thing. I've done so much counsel over the years, and one of the funny things is guys and ladies alike will say, oh, we have a real love. We don't need the piece of paper. I'm like, oh, it's just a piece of paper. It's just a piece of paper that license. I'm like, okay, well, then sign it. No, I'm not signing it. Why not? Well, it's the principle of the thing. No, it isn't. <laughs> you know it isn't. You know that that paper means something more than just, hey, baby, I'll always be there for you. That paper means yeah, and you're going to be held to that promise, and you're not just going to make it lightly and then decide, oh, well, I didn't really mean it. I, I kind of fell out of the same love I fell into and all that. And you go, no, 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 no. There's a ratification of those things. And we'll see some other subjects next week, so it's not all going to be about this. But again, real relationships. Paul's going to put it in proper perspective, and he says contentment, yes, but commitment, yes. You know, uh, that's one of the things that's very important here. And look at verse three. This is great. He says, let the husband render to his wife the affection due her and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife doesn't have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband doesn't have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Now, again, those are some awkward things to be saying in a room. But think about this. I, I laugh about it because I'm like, Lynn got the better deal. Um, hey, guess what you get? My body. <laughs> guess what I get? Yours. Um, you know, that's awesome. Great trade. Um, you know, she probably got the, the, the bad end of that deal. But this is what I think about it. Affection. It uses the word affection. It's a much richer word than sex. It's, it's the entire context of sex. It's everything around physical intimacy it's it's also just the way you talk with someone and the way you treat somebody and see god cares an awful lot about that and it says there it's due it's due you owe it to a, another person and this is a, a very countercultural thing but what i love about it is it's contrary to our culture but it was contrary to theirs it's not an extreme in either way because here's what it does it, it doesn't say like my Life is my life, and I'm going to get married, and I'm still going to I do whatever I want. Well, good luck on that one. Okay, so you, you want to get married or pair with some person and still remain you and do your own thing. And you go, well, why don't you just stay you if you're going to do that? See, I mean, marriage is a decision, a choice to say, I want to give everything that is me away to another person. I'm releasing my right to be me to another person. And you go, well, if that was a one-sided relationship, that would be a pretty dysfunctional, very difficult, challenging, crazy thing. But guess what? They're doing the same thing. It's two I do's. It's two I do's. And if there's any I don't in the I do, man, that's going to turn into a ship wreck. You want to know how to wreck your relationship? Go into it thinking, I retain all my rights to be right on whatever level. You go, well, that'll be a wreck. But if you say, I release my rights, and if the other person releases their rights, you know what's amazing? It becomes, there's plenty of blessing to go around. But if each person is like taking money out of an ATM, <laughs> If it's all withdrawals, well, I withdraw. Withdraw emotionally and physically and spiritually from you. I'm withdrawing. If one person withdraws, well, they're going to go bankrupt. And if both withdraw, they will go bankrupt quicker. But if both deposit freely saying, hey, it's our account. It's our life. It's our emotional health. It's our situation. Then guess what? That tends to be a ship that sails and sails well. So this is what he's saying. Let them... Let them understand, uh, you know, likewise, likewise. I wish I could relate to you today how radical this concept was in the day it was written. So always read the Bible in its context. This was crazy radical because in those days, marriage really wasn't about love. It was an economic arrangement. I mean, go back and do your history lesson. It, it was uh, how many cows for this Kid, you know, I mean, it was arranged stuff. It was all that. It wasn't all the romantic things that we have around it. And so here, Paul is giving power to a lady that did not exist in their day. He's saying, you know what? Husbands, you don't just own your wife. Guess what? She owns you. 
You own each other. Both of you. It's a common thing. This is not one way. It doesn't put the woman in control of the man. It doesn't put the man in control of the woman. It says, you guys both relinquish control. That's what it is. It's, it's releasing of control to say, I am going to let God be in control of so much of these things. It's when you mutually give up the remote control. It's not mine. It's not hers. It's, it's ours. And see, when I think about it, nobody made me do that, right? There were no shotguns at our wedding, thankfully. I, did I fully understand what I was getting into? No. But I would have missed in the greatest blessing of my life if I had thought it through too much. <laughs> See, that's what I love about this. I wish I could convey again how important the yours, mine, ours is. Whenever I would talk with couples, and to this day, when I hear a lot of I, me, mine, I go, oh, I, 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 I. Um, when, you know, it's, well, her, her son was like this, and her, and she, and her, and you go, ooh, what about our? These are, uh, these are, you know, blended words are very important because they talk of blended mentality. And so God designed marriage. He blessed it. He built all kinds of blessings into it. But this is what it says in verse 5. Don't deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. Come together again so Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Again, the Bible's very reserved and it's it's speaking you know it doesn't just like it, it it's not raunchy ever but what's it talking about here it's clearly talking about sexuality right and it says don't deprive each other don't the word is defraud don't like rip a person off you're like ripping someone off if you are in a relationship that has any of the three parts that god intended which was spirituality emotion and physicality he meant all three of those to be together. And again, if somebody emphasizes one to the extent of, or, or to the exclusion of others, the Bible says you're out of balance. That ship will wreck and that ship will not sail very far. And again, there's all kinds of, of difference between folks and people within that thing. And that's why it doesn't really, it leaves some to your imagination, which it should. But I love it because it says by mutual agreement. It's not the super spiritual wife saying, well, we're going to fast and prayer for, pray for the next 75 years. And that's how. It, but you know what? That's even by choosing it that way. Didn't I go with the stereotype that the Bible knocks down, which is it never has the idea that guys like sex and women don't. No, in fact, what it does is it talks about a mutuality here. It talks about the fact that, you know, something that I, I push back on all the time because sometimes there, uh, even, even in our modern day, there's these crazy ideas um, that, you know, it's the boys at our school that are the problem. And, and if, if the girl's skirt is, is, shows their knee, then, wow, guys just can't control it. Really? You know? Um, wow, um, as, as if, you know, as if. Um, and so you think about these things, this is what he's saying. He says there's a lack of self-control. It doesn't say because that guy can't control himself. It says because people lack self-control. The truth is, whatever needs you or I might have, um, if, I, if I starve myself of food, I'm very unlikely to go for healthy food to fix that problem, right? If I, I'm, I'm trying to eat more healthy, um, and that was one of the decisions I've made in the last couple of weeks, and it's already helping me, but guess what? No doctor, no nutritionist would say the secret to lose weight and health, starve yourself, and then you'll make healthy choices. No, you'll go three days without anything, and then, what's in the pantry? Ah! And it won't be something necessarily good. So this is what he's saying. You know, over a lifetime, we weren't, most of us weren't meant to and designed by God to be alone for the majority of our life. Forever alone, just me. I'm just content. It's just me. Paul even addresses that. He says, you know what? You should be in a relationship that flourishes spiritually, emotionally, and physically. And so the Bible makes it clear sex isn't dirty. It's not a duty. It's a beauty. It's something that God created for two people to enjoy over a lifetime. 
And when there's emotional distance, there will be spiritual distance and there will be physical distance and everything else. And it's funny how people who maybe elevated the physicality of their relationship, we just can't keep our hands off each other. You give them a few years and they can't keep their hands off each other. They want to, why? Because they didn't nurture the other uh, equally and even more important at times parts of their relationship. And so this is, you know, a, a, an interesting thought. You know, this is what he's saying. You, God, God uh, if, you, if you just have a sense as a couple, hey, you know what? Right now, the greatest need for intimacy you and I have is, is seeking after God in just a really intense way, which is what fasting and prayer was always about um, in the Bible. They're like, we're going to go without meals. Uh, we're going to go without uh, each other. We're just going to go spend that time in prayer he says okay that's cool for a time for a season but that's a t even that as godly as a reason as that may be he said let's let's face reality man uh that's not a good idea <laughs> he says uh, you can you can get tricked by spiritual thoughts that aren't very spiritual and i wrote this down because i think it's interesting i didn't really write it on a slide but i just thought about it which is um Again, having watched a pattern of things throughout my whole life, this is what the enemy of your soul wants to do. He wants to encourage you to have all kinds of things, but, you know, sexuality outside of God's boundaries. And then he wants to discourage and prevent you from having those same things within God's boundaries. I mean, isn't that funny? It's like his tactic flips depending on which he has a... He has a, a weapon for each situation. Oh, you're single? I'm going to make you discontent and I'm going to make you think that that relationship that's a compromise and everything else is going to content you and it won't. And then I get you into a marriage situation where I say, you know, hey, this is great. And now he comes against that and he's going to say, I'm going to try to rob you of the joy of your togetherness. I'm going to rip, I'll come against that all day long. And you go, isn't that interesting? And so this is what he says, verse 6. I love it. He says, I say this as a concession, not a commandment. What's he saying there? I, I'm giving you a suggestion here. I'm giving you a, a guidance thing. He says, you don't have to do it. I'm not telling you you got to do it. I'm telling you, you don't have to get married. But if you do get married, this is how you ought to do it. But I'm not saying anyone has to get married. Don't get me wrong. He says, I wish all men were even as I myself, but each one has his own gift from God. One manner this has this and another in that. Think about this. Paul is acknowledging the incredible variety of personality in people. And he's saying, man, I'm, I'm content. It, he was a single man at this point. This is what the Bible makes clear in he, this place, but other places too. Paul, the apostle, was a single guy, right? But he wasn't always a single guy. You know how I know? You know how you know? Because he was a member of the Sanhedrin, and the Sanhedrin was married men. They were leaders in their society. They were people who had, uh, he had a wife at some point, and there is no discussion, no detail on what happened to his wife. Did she die? Did she desert him? Did she decide, I liked prominent Paul, the Sanhedrin leader with uh, the status of all that in our society. I don't like prisoner Paul nearly as much. I don't like uh, Paul who didn't have as much uh, as he used to have. And, and so who knows? Did she die or did she desert or did she do whatever? I don't know, but she is never uh, mentioned and he says he is now a single man. We know that Paul didn't ditch her because he talks about it right in here. But think about being happy with your gift. This is what he's saying, happy with your gift. Growing up as a parent, um, and even it's at every age, but I know this, if you get a happy meal, if you wanna see two kids get unhappy, go get one happy meal where there's a different gift in each of the happy meals. It doesn't matter which one they got, but they're both mad at what the other one got. Oh, I like what they got. Well, I like what they got. No matter what you got, you're never happy with your gift. That's a very interesting thought, you know? Um, but I think about my gift. My gift is certainly not singleness. And it's for, for a million reasons, but one of them is um, I would wear the same shirt every single day. Um, and it's not even that Lynn does my laundry, don't get this kind of crazy. I, 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 for the most part, I do my wash, right? But I would just, 
I, I sort of need a little help now and then to say like, wow, that's, I love that shirt, but um, I love some other shirts too. Um, you know, and just little thoughts that are so helpful that I'm like, really, uh, which ones do you like? And so when I think about all the things that have come into my life, kids and all the rest, married life suits me well, right? But this is what Paul says. I, I wish everyone was kind of content wherever they are, but not everyone is, you know? Some people really think, oh, no, 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 I need more, I need more of this and more of that. He says this, verse eight, I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it's good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they can't exercise self-control, let them marry. It's better to marry than burn with passion. What's he saying? It, it's better to marry if you want to marry than it is to not marry and think that God is going to be mad if you do. This is what he's saying. He's saying, you want to remarry? Remarry. But he said, I think you probably, uh, you know, I think about it this way. You know, what couple doesn't do this stuff at every age? You know, it's the, if I died, would you remarry? And all those silly things. And you know what? Uh, I, I hope I never get to answer that question in reality. But seriously, I wouldn't be in any rush. Uh, Len you know, dies, I hope she won't, um, but she does. I'm not gonna be like, I gotta get married tomorrow. Ah! I'm just like, hey, wow, uh, okay, uh, here I am. Uh, try to be content in yourself, meet someone else, maybe, I don't know, is that awkward? Is it strange to say all that? I don't know, but this is what he's saying. He's saying, man, I, I kind of tell you, you probably might be perfectly happy. Um, you know, with the good memories, but not having to put up with them leaving their shoes where they leave them and all that kind of stuff. I mean, my wife has to move a lot of shoes. I'm just, I'm digging in a hole and I'm, there's no way out. But here it is, contentment. Um, verse 10, he says, the, the married, both believers, I command this, yet not I but the Lord. A wife is not to depart from her husband, but even if she does, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband's not to divorce his wife. What is the context? Please remember, again, question and answer. They said, yeah, but what if she just can't take it anymore? He says to the married, he's talking about two believers here. He says, uh, yet not I, but the Lord. He says this, God, God's made it clear. Believers aren't supposed to, uh, you can't say I'm a believer, but I'm going to believe in her. Well, I, I guess you're not acting like much of a believer if you're doing that. What do you mean? He's saying if you're married, stay married. The, the, that's a direct quote from Jesus, Matthew 19. It's easy enough. Divorce, uh, it, it, what, he says these are the things that lead to it. Adultery, death, or desertion. <laughs> he says, you know, if somebody leaves, you can't hold on to them. But you can't, if you're the lever, then you are in control of that. And that's what he's saying. If you're a believer, don't leave her. He says, what's, what's the big there? You promised, keep your promise. But they didn't keep their promise. Okay, that's them. That's not you. Verse 12, but to the rest, I, not the Lord, say. This verse, you ought to circle this verse somewhere in your mind. Verse 12, 1 Corinthians 7, why? He says to everybody else, I'm talking to everyone else. He says, I, not the Lord. Is that a crazy thing to be written down into the Bible? What is it saying? Paul is basically saying, I don't have a direct Jesus quote on this one. I don't have something Jesus already said that I'm just pointing you to Matthew 19 and saying, here's what it says about relationships. He's expressing a perspective. He's expressing a thought. He's expressing a godly man's perspective on a topic. But he's not saying, thus saith the Lord. In fact, he's telling you, no, thus saith the Paul. I'm not saying, thus saith the Lord. I'm saying, thus saith Paul. Now, it, depending on your, your view of scripture, I view it as if Paul said it and God preserved it, um, it's also the Lord saying it because this is God's word. But notice that Paul was aware at the time, hey man, I'm just, I'm just trying to give you some wisdom here. I don't have a direct quote. And so this is what he says. If a brother has a wife who doesn't believe she's willing to live with him, don't divorce her. This was a more complex issue than just should two believers stay together. He says, well, that one's obvious. Jesus already talked about this. But what about if a believer wants to leave, what do you do? Well, we're going to see a, a chapter coming up there where he talks about not being unequally yoked. But he says, if a believer is considering married and marrying an unbeliever, what would Paul's advice be? Don't do it. Why? Because he says, 
Why would, a, why would an unbeliever and a believer be a one true pairing? How could that possibly be that the most important relationship in your life, which is God's, is not shared between these two people? It's just that simple. Um, Len and I have had a 28-year, I guess now I would say uh, 20, you know, coming up on 29 there, uh, love triangle, which, uh, but not all of it was a love triangle. The love triangle is <laughs> she loves God, I love God, and we love each other, right? And, and that triangle really works extremely well. As I try to love God and she tries to love God, what do you know? It draws us closer together as we go closer to him. It's just geometry, right? There's your geometry lesson. So, it, but if, if, if my God is money and her God is God, then I'm chasing money and she's chasing God. And as I chase money, I am going in opposite directions from her. She's saying, why would an unbeliever say my soulmate has not had their soul touched by God. I mean, that, that, that doesn't make any sense to me. And that doesn't make any sense to Paul. And that's what he's saying. <laughs> I don't know how someone could say, I have found my life's goal to be married to someone who doesn't believe and follow Jesus. That will be a rough road. You want to you shipwreck your life? <laughs> Connect yourself to someone who is not connected to God. Um, but then, you know, he says, but there's also this thing where maybe you were both unbelievers or whatever, and then you get married and one of you converts and the other one doesn't. And what's, then what do you do? Well, see, some people were giving the advice there in Corinth, ditch the dog. I mean, if they're a bad, if they're a heathen, get away from them. You know, you should turn your back on all that. And you're godly now. Get away from that ungodly person. And Paul says, no, 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 no. Remember, he says... There's a reason to stay. You know what the reason to stay is? He says it right here. Verse 14, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. The unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they're holy. What's he saying? Think about this. He's saying, notice the word sanctified. It doesn't say saved. Nobody can save another person. My faith can't save Lynn. Hers can't save my, me. Mine can't save my kids. People's faith saves people. But guess what? My faith can certainly influence people, can't it? It can either repel or draw people. And if the thing, think about this little scenario. Let me just give you a little scenario. I've seen it in real life. Two unbelievers, two total heathens. Somebody gives their life to the Lord. And you know what they do? They treat their unbelieving spouse like garbage because they're always... They, they're, they're mad at them now because they want them to be godly. So they're like, they, they criticize them for their ungodliness. They treat them all these ways that, it, that are frustrating. And, you know, th then they get all high and mighty holy on them and everything else. And, and what is that? Is that person being drawn to Christ at that point? Is that person saying, well, Jesus sure did amazing things for you. I, I want him to do the same for me. He's like, no, he made you into a Pharisee. He made you into a... a, a humorless, terrible person to be around. We were more fun as heathens. But what, what if you change that scenario and you have a person who's like, man, you used to have such a short fuse and you'd be in my face angry all the time. And guess what? Somehow you're more patient with me than you were before. I've seen that too, where the unbelieving spouse was sanctified, was cleansed, was brought toward Jesus as this result. And the kids the same way because kids... There's some kids in the room. I'd call them kids because anyone younger than me is a kid. Um, kids observe things. They're not dumb. They're smarter than, than we wish they were. And you know what? Kids are really good at looking at their parents' relationships and deciding whether or not that's a ship they want or a ship they don't. Um, they're, they're really good at it. And you know what? Every, every relationship has its you know, problems and difficulties. But again, a very personal thing to say in this room. I, I hope I could say on some level to my daughters, look for a guy who treats you at least as well as I've treated your mom. And if he talks to you in ways that you didn't see me talk to your mom, don't put up with it one more second. You know, I, I think my kids could say that I don't run my wife down, throw her under the bus, treat her poorly. I don't. Could I be better? Of course I could be better. And hopefully they'll do better. But my point is, I hope they could look at our relationship and not say, 
I know what I don't want. I don't want that. And so as a starting point, this is what he's saying. He's saying, don't run off of a difficult situation. Be content, even in a situation that might be very, very difficult. Because if you've got the content of Christ and there's someone else who doesn't, boy, they ought to be able to look over at you and see something they want. Okay, so now we come on over here to verse 16, 17. He says, for how do you know, O wife, whether you'll save your husband? Again, Jesus saves husbands, but he's using the point, how do you know that your influence would not lead to his salvation? How do you know, O husband, whether you'll save your wife? But as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, let him so walk. And that's what I say in all the churches. He's saying, this is universal, man. It's not just Corinth. I say this everywhere I go. He's saying, stay, let, walk on the path you're on. Pick a smart path if you're not on it yet. If I can give you a principle that I think would go so deep into our lives. It's, if you're at a fork in the road, take the right fork, right? Take the right direction. If you're at a decision point, if you're single, stay single till it's the right thing to not be single, right? But if you're married, you've made that decision. So now what do you make? A new decision, which is, I'm going to make this path as right as I could possibly make it. Well, I think I married the wrong person. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> be the right person. Be Mr. Right, even if she's Miss Wrong, or vice versa. And that's what he's saying here. He's saying, I say this everywhere I go. How do you know what the outcome will be? How do you know what influence this might bring? You don't have control over another person, but you certainly have control over you. You don't have control over the decisions you've made in your past, and God never gives you guilt over things you can't change anymore. But he always gives you a challenge to change what you can and to be content with that which you can't. So look at that. What a thought. As the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. Walk your path. Contentment. Be content with your content. If you live for God where you are right now, you'll be amazed how God has a way of just bringing you there. So now he goes to other circumstances than marriage. And so I'm glad we're out of the um, sort of awkward and sensitive portion of this. And now we're going to get into circumcision, which, of course, is not, not <laughs> awkward or weird at all. Okay, so verse 18. It was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised, however that would happen. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. Okay, so again, this was question number two. Okay, enough about the whole sex thing. Um, can I ask a, a, a question about circumcision? This is, he, so now he's addressing this. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he's called. So he's basically saying, stick with the program. If you're Jewish, don't worry about it. If you're Gentile, don't worry about it. That was the old covenant. This is the new covenant. Stay as you are. Don't worry about it. Now he goes on to another one. Okay, verse 21. Any questions there? <laughs> no questions. Verse 21. Were you called while a slave? Don't be concerned about it. If you can be made free, if you can be made free, but use that. You know, if you got an out, use the out. If the door's open, take it. But he says, verse 22, he who's called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's free man. He who's called while free is Christ's slave. You were brought, bought with a price. Don't become slaves of men. Brethren, let each one remain with God in the state in which he was called. Oh, my goodness. Again, verse 21 to 24. What would some people want me to do? Speak out against slavery. Okay, I'll speak out against slavery. God is against slavery. He's against the ownership of people from one person to another. The Bible is clear throughout. But it also is real Asianships, right? Slavery existed. God can abolish it all he wants. Man will continue to do it. So what do you do when you're in a situation that you say, well, I don't think I should be a slave. And you're like, well, I agree. God is all about freedom. He's not all about slavery. But he says, but if you're a slave, you could be content. It's possible. Now, again, that's a strong statement for a guy who hasn't been a slave to be. But, you know, let's, let's throw it over into, into employment. 
Be content. You, if you are not content as an employee, you will never be content as the boss. I know people who are like, man, when I'm the boss, I... No, no, no. If you ain't happy working for somebody, you ain't going to be happy when people aren't working for you. <laughs> when they're as bad employees as you were when you were an employee, if you're not content as an employee, you will not be content as the boss. If you're not content as a child, you will not be content as a parent. If you are not content as a single, you will not be content as a married person. If you're not content as a married person, you won't be content when all that's behind you and you say, now I'm content. No, you won't. Because... This is what he's saying. <laughs> if you are owned by the Lord, you can go in some situations that in and of themselves would cause tremendous discontentment. He says, I don't really work for you anyway. You're an awful slave master, but guess what? I have a great God in heaven. And when you think about some of the greatest music and everything else that came out of those things, I'm not trying to in any way romanticize what that is, but you know what? I know some, I, I can guarantee you there were some slaves who were happier than their masters. I guarantee it. Because I've seen it to this day. I've seen places where you go and somebody has absolutely nothing. And they're more content with their nothing than someone who has everything in the house on the hill. You go, why is that? Because it really doesn't come down to those things. My parents had a cartoon on their uh, fridge when I was growing up. And it had a thought bubble or a voice bubble over every one of the 50 states and everyone in every state was saying let's move somewhere else um, and and it's it's true because you know I, I laughed at it as a kid but I laugh at it more now when I think about it because he said let everyone remain in the state in which they're called so you go okay well I, I you know I, I came to the Lord in Florida really but I mean I knew of God Growing up in Colorado, I've been in several states. What state is he talking about? He's not talking about the United States. He's talking about whatever status, whatever situation, whatever thing you're in. He says, if God called you there, maybe he has a purpose for you there. If he called you single, does that mean I'm single forever? No, he just talked about that. But you're single now, so find that thing of why you're, well, he probably called me when I was single, so I'd be immediately married. I got to fix that. Like, no, I could be so much more useful then. No. If he called you married, be married. If he called you in, in, in a, you know, retirement, stay retired. That's what I'm saying. But, but this is what he's saying, an important principle. Be content with the context. See, God doesn't waste anything. I remember this. When I first came to faith, uh, I thought I had wasted most of my life because I had... Uh, gone to business school, I had gone through business things, I had learned a lot of business principles, and I'm like, man, none of this matters at all. You know, I, all I got to know is Bible verses and stuff. I should have gone to Bible college instead of all this. And, and you know what? I come back and I look at it now and I see the path God had for my life. And he called me in a status, in a state, a married man with certain responsibilities and everything else. And guess what? Instead of thinking, you know what I need to do? I need to get away from my family so I can serve God unencumbered. And I've heard these conversations from idiots who think God is speaking to them. And you're like, might want to learn this verse. You know, if we were... If things were different, we could do so much different. But why are things, why would we want that? See, God, God wants our circumstances to change us, not always for us to change our circumstances. Where we live, where we drive, where we work, all these things are not accidents. And contentment is such an important thing. Verse 25, concerning virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord. Yet I give a judgment as one from whom the Lord in his mercy has made me trustworthy. Again, he's saying, Jesus, uh, again, I, I don't really have a, you know, Jesus notes on this, but he says, I, God's kind of put me in a place of some wisdom and understanding, and he says, I'm going to talk about this. The word virgin, as it's used there, it's very interesting. I got to remind you, this was a culture in which arrangements were made by parents for their kids, right? Isn't it funny how we change what we want to change about the Bible and we keep what we want to keep and we don't think about what is contextual and what is um, universal and, and, and putting some wisdom to that? We need to sometimes because I notice people aren't still arranging marriages, right? So there's things that last eternally and, and, and are movable and there's things that are immovable and we ought to think through those and be very sure which one we're talking about here. But 
this passage is actually talking to, uh, it's, it's vague because um, interpreters have looked at it and say, are they talking to the, in this case, the girl who was going to get married? Or is it talking to, and not yet married? That's how they would refer to him. Or are they talking to the dad who's trying to decide what to do with his daughter who's getting a little older and he's not sure what to do? I believe, you can draw your own conclusions, if it matters to you in any way, <laughs> it's talking to the dad because it talks about decisions he should make. But this, is, this passage, in a way, you can almost put a cross through it because I don't, I'm going to teach it, but... I, I, but what it does is it shows contentment again. This is what he says. Um, I'm giving a judgment here. He says, I suppose this is good because of the present distress, that it's good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Don't seek to be loosed. Are you loose from a wife? Don't seek a wife. Even if you do marry, you haven't done anything wrong. You haven't sinned. If a virgin marries, she hasn't sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh. I would just spare you. <laughs> So he's kind of talking to young people, but he's also talking to the parents in it. So it's, it's the whole family he's talking to. And he says, these are troubled times, man. And I can tell you marriage will be trouble. I'd spare you it. I'd spare you some of the difficulty of being a family during these times. What kind of times were they having? They were having times where people were being put to death for their faith. Again, I just remind you, context matters a ton. They were in extreme times. And he's saying here, you know what? If you guys are going to be chased out of town, it's going to be really hard if you're carrying kids on that. You're going to carry a weight that's so much more than you would if you just had to make a run for it and try and spare your life here. There was persecution going on. It was written right before a major persecution of Christians in the historical context. There was a lot of things. So picture, again, Syrian refugees. Picture wherever it's pretty easy to picture some of these things worldwide like right now you know in different places there's a lot going on that's just even more troubling sort of and you think about it and you go here's something i know the greatest joy in my life is my kids but i can tell you if there was a house fire it's different for me to jump out just thinking of me and think is bethany okay is carissa okay is steven there How's Lynn? How's Gracie the dog? What is he saying? The more you got in your life, the more complex your life gets. And he's saying life's pretty complex right now in Corinth and it's about to get really difficult. And he said, some of you are like just all about, I, oh, he's so and so and he's so cute and all this. And he's like, those are amazing thoughts. But you're about to get eclipsed by something that may make all that seem like, I wish I hadn't been planning so much of that, and I might have thought about my own maturity and my own readiness for some stuff. I don't know. I think it's an interesting thought. You know this, that in movies, why do they never have guys um, like spies? Why can't spies have families? Because the spy will be tortured and tortured and tortured and never give up. But they say, you know what we're going to do? We know where your daughter is, and we're going to go kill her if you don't tell her. And all of a sudden, this tough guy is weaked out. Why? Because our relationships, if we value them, they have the capacity to bring us the greatest joy and the greatest sorrow. And this is what Paul's saying. He says, this I say, the time is short, so that from now on, even those who have wives should as though they have none. Those who weep as though they don't weep. He said, you, you got a bad situation? Don't worry, it might be over soon. He says, those who rejoice, don't rejoice too much, um, as if you, it would go on forever. Because he says, verse 31, those who use this world don't misuse it. The forms and fashions of this world are passing away. What is he saying? I think this is why this passage applies to everyone, whether you're single, married, divorced, uh, you know, hoping to, to be something that you're not, um, wishing you were somewhere else than you are. He's saying, time's short, man. Time is very, very short. And singleness is a season, but the life season is over pretty fast too. And I've been really grateful to have seasons uh, where it was just me, uh, seasons where it was just us, just Lynn and I, just the kid. Now we're getting into seasons where it's like uh, there's, they're around less often and you're like, eh, you know, and, and, and you just realize, hey, seasons come, seasons go, enjoy them, but don't hold on to them because seasons come and seasons go. This is what he's saying. 
Don't think this life is to be held on to because of that person making you content. If you can't be content through every season of life, there's going to be seasons in which everything goes great and everything goes terrible. And see, this is what I think about. These are, these are real words. I'll close it out here. Verse 32 to the end, he says, But I want you to be without care. He who's unmarried cares about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. In other words, if your relationship with the Lord is contenting you, you're, you're just all about, hey, how can I serve God? This is what Paul was doing. He's like, I, I don't have to ask, hey, kids, you want to go do this? He, he just did it, right? He says, but he who's married cares about the things of the world, how he might please his wife. Nothing wrong. This is not condemned. It's just described. He says, you know, you have to ask. How is this affecting everyone around me? And he says, there's a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she might please her husband. He's just basically saying, if it, you know, single people, it's a little simpler. Simple single, complex, married. I say this for your own profit, he says, verse 35. Not that I might put a leash on you, but what's proper that you may serve God without distraction? And again, I'll just read through this section because I think you'll gain from it, but you might also just say, I don't know that it has anything to do with this today. He says, if any man thinks he's behaving improperly toward his virgin daughter, I would put in, um, you know, parentheses, if she's past the flower of youth, and otherwise she's, the time's ticking, thus it must be, let him do what he wishes. He doesn't. Mary, let them marry. It's kind of like give her to the guy and let him marry. Nevertheless, he who stands steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but has power over his own will, he's determined in his heart that he will keep his virgin daughter. He does well too. He's like, you don't have to be thinking, I got to give this girl away to, and, and have a good marriage and the boys and all this stuff. He says, he who gives her, see, this is what I'm saying, verse 38, if you're confused through this, it's, it is kind of confusing. That's why I say scholars choke on it. But verse 38, he who gives her in marriage does well. In other words, the guy who arranges his daughter's marriage is, does something he should celebrate, and he who doesn't does even better. <sighs> what does this mean? Be content. A wife is bound by the law as long as her husband lives. If her husband dies, she's free to be married to whoever she wants, as long as he's in the Lord. But she's happier if she doesn't, I think, he says, according to my judgment. I think I also got God's opinion on this one. What's he saying? Single is simple. Single is simple. So if you want a simple life, stay single. Um, if you want a fruitful life, Get married, stay married, ride it through all of the ups and downs, stay connected emotionally, spiritually, and physically. Enjoy that season while it lasts. It might be over at some point in your life, and then you say, well, now what? Man, what do I do? Be content. Be content. And that's what he says. I think of this. I'll, I really will let you go. Yes, you'll be content when I let you go. But I, I knew some guys in Miami that banded together. They were going to be a band of brothers called Raptures, uh, Bachelors Till the Rapture. Um, their whole idea was, you know, don't need no girl. We're just going to serve the Lord. We're going to do this. Uh, it's disbanded, by the way. It's slowly disbanded. It, it disbanded each time each one of them got a band uh, on, their, uh, on their finger, you know. And now they're, they're not Bachelors to the Rapture. The Rapture hasn't come, but they're... they're uh, it's amazing. They're fruitful in what they're doing. And what was great is, you know, they were single for a season and they made the most of that. And I see them now married for another season and they're making the most of that. And that's, that I think is, if you boil this chapter down to a single thought, it's that be content with your content. Don't overload your life. Get out of balance and have it, you know, think I, one more container will make me satisfied and maybe that's what they did just one more just one more i just need one more relationship and down it went so quality 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 thank you lord for all that you do